Well, hello there. <laughs> I feel like I haven't spoken to you in, uh, I don't know, two weeks. But you, you weren't gone that long. How long were you in Disney for? I spoke to you an hour ago. No, I know, but like, how is Disney? <laughs> Incredible. Did the, did the kids have the best time? Almost as much fun as I had. Okay. Have you? Well, you went as a child, but you haven't been since? I haven't been in 25 years. Okay. I, I felt the same way when I took my kids. It's just pure what, magic. Yep. What was their favorite thing? What did they get into? Uh, Kobe loved it all. I don't know, for real. Like every, they loved meeting yeah. the characters. Just it was just so sweet. Like they're the perfect. They're the perfect age. Yeah, it's just it's too, it's too much. My, heart, I'm, so my heart, I'm so I'm so happy for you. Yeah, my heart was melting. It was it was incredible. So the next one you'll do when they get a little bit bigger is Universal. Um, same kind of thing. Funny you mentioned that. Uh, we had we had a pool day on Friday. I said to Robin, I might just hop over to Universal by myself, but I was just too beat. <laughs> That's weird, dude. You don't want to do that. Well, no, people, I, I literally, I do. People would be I looking really at do. you like, who's this solo guy getting on I rides? really would love to do Universal. Yeah, I, so I'd love to go with my kids, but I go by myself too. Wait two years and they're going to yeah. want to go and yeah. then you'll do yeah. it. All right. Yeah. Very cool. Hey, everybody. Welcome to What Are Your Thoughts? But I miss the audience. I miss, being, I miss hanging out with the audience and you guys. Same. Same. It's, it's not the same kind of week when we don't check in with the pound. Uh, welcome to What Are Your Thoughts with Michael Batnick and me, Downtown Josh Brown. Nicole is here. John is here. Duncan is here. Sean is probably here. Um, Sean works more hours than anybody I know. What, Sean's the best. What, Sean what, is the best. What is with this Ozempic? I don't understand. This is now t- two references from you in two days. What, are you okay? It's, yeah. No. I don't know what Ozempic is, but. So I'm, I'm, I'm not taking Ozempic. But a lot of uh, overweight people I'm friends with are, and none of them have diabetes. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what Ozempic is. Is it uh, a all right. weight so loss Google, thing? Google that, and we'll do this next week. Got I want to say a quick couple of hellos to, uh, to the Pounders who are here in the chat. Part-time Larry is back. Jay Luther, Dave Wilson, Diego is here. Evan D, Cliff, we see you. Uh, Rachel's hanging. Uh, Dave Airy, Jack Rosenfield, Roger's here. The whole gang is here tonight. I'd shout everyone out if we had the time. Um, but we have a lot to get to. And first, a word from our sponsor, Y Charts. Michael, this is you. Me. I'm up. Yeah. Um, all right, listen. <laughs> many of you <laughs> many of you put put the screen back up. Many of you may enter, not all of you may get through. They've got a hundred slots. We didn't fill it up last time, apparently. I, I don't know what what people are waiting for you've got you've got a free uh, a free shot to the goods listen i use y charts for wait wait you know hold on let me teach you how to do this no i'm doing it what is what is it. being I'm what is being it. offered i'm doing it okay back off all right y charts is offering you uh a mo- uh, through march the end of march it's it's a, a sp- uh, march manda celebration of sorts mm. you get full access to the platform like i do and i use it when i say i use it multiple times a day believe you me i use it multiple times a day real estate stocks indexes, portfolios. I mean, the whole, the works. So what do the hundred people get though? For a full access. I know, but I'm saying that you have to say that. So I said it. Okay. Rewind the tape. All right. All right. All right. A little, <laughs> you're uh, part-time Larry saying you're a little bit rusty. I, I agree. It's been, <laughs> you haven't done a live read in a while. I'm just, I'm just saying there's an order to these things. Okay. Like, all right. All right. Let's get, let's matter. get, let's get to the show. You're first. No, guess what? Eh, I'll save it for next week. Uh, no, no, Dave, no. Dave Wilson wants to know who's going to raise their voice first. I feel like we started out with raised voices. Yeah, didn't we just do that? Yeah, we did that already. All right, let's go. Me. I'm up. Yeah. Uh, see, I, 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 part-time Larry is right. I am definitely rusty. I, I was going to say, do you want you, you, you want to start, start it over. From the start top. it over. Start, let's take it from the top. All right, we're going to talk about the Berkshire letter. Yep. Oh, how could we not? Who did, how could that? We not? Who did this? Who did what? Look at the screen. I'm looking at the screen. A la uh, Star that. Wars. Uh, that's got to be uh, John or, okay. or Duncan. All right, well done, ahead. boys. So uh, uh, in, uh, five years ago, maybe even six, I don't even know, I wrote a little book called Big Mistakes. Mm, yeah. The, the Best Investors and Their Worst Investments. Um, and I was reminded of this little book here, reading Uncle Warren's writing. So allow me to quote him if you will. Please. He said, over the years, I have made many mistakes. Consequently, our extensive collection of businesses currently consists of a few enterprises that have truly extraordinary economics, many that enjoy very good economic characteristics, and a large group that are marginal. Along the way, other businesses in which I have invested have died, their products unwanted by the public. Capitalism has two sides. The system creates an ever-growing pile of losers 
while concurrently delivering a gusher of improved goods and services. Schumpeter called this phenomenon creative destruction. So allow myself to quote myself. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, Buffett has included the word mistake 163 times in his annual letters. Probably wow. now that's, pushing that's 170. Um, so one of Buffett's superpowers, it's not, it's not false humility. I don't think he's like doing this to like get a pat. Like it's true. He has had a lot of clunkers and he is very deliberate to remind you about them that he's not perfect. But also the bigger point is that it doesn't take a lot of really big winners to overcompensate for the losers. Now I'm not talking about for you, the, the listener of individual stock pickers. I'm talking about like, this is how the index fund works, right? Like Apple f- comes and GE falls. Like that's just the way that it works. Right. And Buffett, to his credit, has earned the right to get married to stocks, right? He's owned, so for example, he bought Coca-Cola over a seven year period ending in 1994. They bought 400 million shares of Coca-Cola for a total of $1.3 billion. Yeah. In 2022, they received $704 million worth of dividends, yeah. almost half their purchase price. The shares are now worth $25 billion. Most people do not have the the chutzpah, the gumption, the wherewithal, the knowledge to hold the stock for 35 years because you don't have the conviction because you're not doing the work. But that's that's Buffett's greatness. Well, it's a couple it's of, never selling. There's, there's a couple of things here. The first is the stocks that he has owned for 30 years or more tend to be stocks where – the conviction is a little bit easier to have because all you have to do is look around and see people using the product. Amex and Coke are two very good examples of that. Um, So so that's one. The second thing, though, that I I thought you were going to get into, but I'll I'll, I'll raise the issue, um, is that he ends the letter by talking about how the weeds wither away and the flowers continue to bloom. So like Coke and Amex are two stocks that he was acquiring in the 80s. Well, read this. Did you put them in the doc or did I? You did. I put it in the doc. Oh, you did. Oh. So the lesson for investors, the weeds wither away in significance as the flower blooms. Over time, it takes just a few winners to work wonders. And yes, it helps to start early and live into your right. 90s as well. So let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. What? There's not a lot of companies. We're not talking stocks. There's not a lot of companies that you can confidently say will be here in 50 years. I'll give you one. And I would, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Um, will Disney World ever not be the most magical place on earth? Like, can you ever, will Mickey Mouse ever not be just amazing? I don't know. Ron DeSantis seems pretty intent on shutting the whole thing down. <laughs> so I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's a good one. It's an obvious one. And and yet, Disney, you did this, has actually underperformed the S&P 500 <laughs> since 1993. 90, yeah, yeah. Which is just, it's just, it's so 30 years cuts. of being a Disney shareholder which is the, one of the greatest companies of all time. You did okay. And you still underperformed the index. You did okay, but you didn't right. outperform the index. Yeah, well, it's so incredible. A- actually, Andrew Barry at Barron's came knives out for uh, Buffett after this nice. letter. What yeah. You, okay. He was what like, he was like, thanks for one of the shortest letters you've ever written. And by the way, you didn't answer any of the questions that anyone has. Do you want to know what, what they were? He, what does he have else I'll to can, say? Well, can I, can I say? 90, go ahead. So the first point he made was that Coke actually has underperformed the index. For 20 years or something, which is – I didn't look it up. I'm sure it's true. Okay. Um, the second is, are you at all going to address the elephant in the room, which is that Coke is one of the leading contributors to obesity, specifically among children around the world? Um, another question was, why are you still playing so coy over your uh, succession plan? Like – Names have been floated, and we know that Greg Abel and and Reg- Jane, yeah, and Jane, yeah. and but Jane is in his seventies. Like, why well, you're ninety two? What are you like? Literally, what are you waiting for? Then when you're ninety five, you want to write this? So uh, I thought. Listen, I don't agree with it, and uh, my take is I really don't. I really don't think that Buffett uses this letter as a forum to critique companies he's invested in. I think if you were to ask him behind closed doors. He would probably say, look, yeah, there's obviously things about Coke that haven't been great for society, but show me a company that is 100% pure and good for everyone that comes into contact with it. It's probably like an unrealistic ideal. Um, Buffett came after the buy, the anti-buyback uh, people, which looked like a swipe at Biden, and Buffett is not a Republican per se, um, but Biden – 
Biden's administration has been very vocally anti-buyback or they want to do a much bigger tax on buybacks than just 1%. And that's okay. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But the rhetoric about how buybacks are universally bad is what Buffett took issue with. I believe he called those people economically illiterate. Something Economic along illiterates. Economic uh, illiterates. Or, or silver-tongued demagogues. So th- I, I, I got into this for like two seconds on TV today. The, the point that Buffett's making is that if you own a business and you have excess capital, there's not a million options. There are a few options, and clearly you have to prioritize which make the most sense for a given period of time. So one option is dividends. Another option is to spend more in CapEx. Another option is to make an acquisition. And then another option is to shrink your float. And when you shrink your, your share count, the shareholders that don't sell end up with a larger proportion of the business and a larger proportion of its cash flows. I think and a legit- I think it's perfectly legitimate. Yeah, but a, a legitimate criticism of buybacks is where it's really to offset C-suite executive Agreed. compensation. He didn't get into that. He but didn't yes. get, so there's, that's the nuance, and that part of it is total uh, total horseshit, and uh, I don't know what you do about that, but the, the just the, the general going after buybacks, you might as well go after dividends. It's a return of capital shareholders. It's well, silly. The one thing is the one thing is that the truth about buybacks is they are one of several factors that have led to an explosion in wealth among the top ten percent of Americans. But a that explosion would have happened with or it's without buybacks? buybacks. No, it's not because buybacks did something wrong. No, it's because the wealthy people own the stock. That's why. That's my, that's what I'm saying. So even so the outlaw buy. Well, I mean, fine. Buybacks, buyback. All right, all right. Let me make let me make it let me, let me make let me make it a little bit more fair. And Buffett talks about the example of his, his ownership in Apple. Every time they shrink the share count of Apple, Buffett's proportion of Apple's cash flows and dividends grows. So take this away from Buffett and think about just the class of people who own 80% of the stock market. They are the primary beneficiary so, of buybacks. It's hard to make the case that people with no stocks are benefiting at all. Of course, but they right. people with don't, that own stocks, buybacks is not neither, neither here nor there, but this is Buffett's superpower. 90, uh, you know, investing for legitimately 70 plus years, he never sold. That's it. That's what his success boils down to. Is he the best stock picker of all time? Probably not. He never sold. He never sold, so it so the buybacks benefit him to the extent that they're buying shares from a willing shareholder, a willing seller. He's not a willing seller. That's right. That's um, right. So anyway, today or yesterday, we saw the the New York Times reported semiconductor manufacturers seeking a slice of nearly forty billion dollars in new federal subsidies will need to ensure affordable childcare for their workers, limit stock buybacks. All right, whatever. Um, so now this is this is becoming totally wrangled uh, by the political class, and it's yeah. a complete clown it's show. It's turning into Europe, and yeah. that's not good. No, it's if not you, good. If you look at the ret- if you look at the returns of European stock markets, one of the reasons why they trail the United States over the long, long, long term, maybe not in any given year, is how much involvement the country governments and uh, the EU have with what companies can and can't do, and. It's all well-intentioned, and there are people who live there who would say, we'll take this system over the shit show you're running over there, and maybe they have less wealth inequality. I don't really know if I believe any of the stats, but um, any time that uh, there is a big federal program, I think the government should have some say in how that money is being directed, but should they get into other areas of how a company runs itself irrespective of of that program? I'm not a fan of that. Right. All right, let's move on. All right. Uh, it was a bad year for 401ks. I mean, this is a little bit of a tautology. Stock market and bond market went down. 401ks predominantly invested in stocks and bonds. And there you have it. Um, but I thought the data here was interesting, uh, and I want to get your it. take on it. Fidelity Investments had 299,000 seven-figure workplace retirement accounts. Those are for individuals at the end of – no, that, those are for actual workplaces. Right, so two hundred and ninety nine thousand workplace retirement accounts. These are just uh, individual accounts. Four hundred one ks, IRAs. Like one person's four hundred one k. Yeah. yeah. Yes, um, and that's down from four hundred forty two thousand a year prior, according to data from the asset manager. So, in other words, in one year, from four hundred forty two thousand four hundred one k millionaires, you lost about a hundred and forty thousand of them. They became sub millionaires. 
and that's primarily because their assets went down. Uh, the decline in million-dollar-plus savings came as the average 401k lost 20% of its value last year, which is about in line with the S&P, um, hit by the slump in bonds and mega-cap tech stocks. Uh, Come on, is there a point coming? We have a chart. So I bet if you plotted this alongside the S&P 500, it would be pretty much one-to-one. One, one one. It would be fairly linear. Um, the number of 401k millionaires grows as the market goes up. And so I think it's just a good reminder that, you know, uh, what the markets give, sometimes they temporarily take away. Uh, the last thing I would say is, is How about the, this? Go the ahead. average 401k, what do you think the average 401k account of Fidelity is? As of 2022's fourth quarter, the average, average, average. Uh, not median, average. Uh, ninety thousand. It's high. It's higher. It's higher than I would have guessed. One hundred and three thousand. One hundred and three thousand nine hundred is the average. So that mm. must be skewed way up by, you know, the the seven figure accounts because you got to believe also... there's a lot of tiny ones. Well, then, then the tiny ones would drag them down too. Here's the thing. No, I know. I'm saying Here's the but thing. There's, there's probably more large ones than tiny ones. No? Yeah, probably. I, I understand why this story was written. It's, it's, you know, it's juicy. There's not a story here. I mean, so if Ben and I were talking about this on the podcast today. Since 2020, what do you think the S&P 500 has compounded at? In, inclusive of 2022? Just going, starting uh, yesterday. Through yesterday. So oh, inclusive, through yesterday. Of, inclusive of the up know, and then eight, the down. Eight, eight percent. Yes, exactly. Eight and a half percent. Yeah. So, yeah, stocks are off their highs. I mean, okay. Yeah, well, there's more to it than that, but no, yes, I, I, no, I, I, I mean, I agree. There's no smoking gun in connection with this story, but it, the, I think the main point is this is the way the majority of people invest is through a retirement account and specifically a 401k if they work in corporate America. And there's no there's no free ride, and it's not uh, straight up and when the markets fall, your retirement account falls because you're invested in the markets. And, you know, it's just something that should be expected. It, I can imagine, though, if you had a million dollars in a 401k and then it was 800000 you're like, you're not, you're not thrilled. Uh, and, you know, somebody that's self-directed and just is investing directly no doubt. in their own 401k. No doubt. Yeah, and I'm not trying to minimize it. I just, I just, you know, the markets go up and the markets go down. Yep. All right. Fair enough. Uh, um, what do you got? All right. Let's get, let's get back to basics. So... This is from the Credit Suisse Global Investment Returns, the yearbook. They do this uh, every year. And I was talking about this with Ben today. I like to, to read Buffett. This is the because, guys from London, Staunton, Dimson, and Dimson Marsh. Dimson, Marsh, yeah. yeah, just, yeah. It, you know, Buffett, just the way that he writes simply, you know, it just, sometimes it's just nice to get back to basics. So, all right, this is the cumulative returns on the U.S. and U.K. asset classes in nominal on the left and real on the right. Holy and what you're going to see is on the left upper left quadrant, that's the USA, 9.5% a year for stocks, 47 for bonds. This is point, back to the year 1900? Yeah, 3.4% <laughs> a year for, for cash. And inflation is 2.9% a year. Go ahead. Hold on. So the USA top left box, USA in nominal terms, is up 70,200% from, from the year 1900? That, that's, uh, that's the... That's the uh, Oh wow! That's nine and a half percent of, at hundred over one hundred and twenty years. Whatever. Uh, yeah. So it's a lot, and 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 even even after adjusted for inflation, the point is, the point is, stocks are the only game in town for real wealth creation. Well, that's not really true. Real estate that's is, not is, true. is that's not true. Um, but vending I get, machines. Vending. Yeah, that's true. No, there's other ways to make money. I, I take that back. But business. How about this? Owning a business. Over a long period of time, and or I should say, like owning a collection of businesses, good businesses. Buffett said, "I have been investing for eighty years, more than one third of our country's lifetime. Despite our citizens' penchant, almost enthusiasm for self-criticism and self-doubt, I have yet to see a time when it made sense to make a long-term bet against America. And I doubt very much that any reader of this letter will have a different experience in the future. So let's put some numbers on this. Ben did, does his chart. There's so How much is- doubt. There's so much doubt always, about always. America's future. Always. No, I, I think it ebbs and flows. I don't think in the ni- in the late 1990s there was there. It felt like it feels now. In Guess the early what? There's 2020s. no more with with social media. There's no more ebbing and flowing. It just is. It just is. It's, okay, it's never going fair. back. That's fair. Um, so how often is the stock market positive? 
over a one month period, 63%. The point is the yeah. longer your time horizon, I use the this more, all the time, the more likely you are to have a successful investment return. And listen, obviously nothing's guaranteed. Obviously in order to earn these returns, you have to buy and hold unless you're an incredible trader. And I know there's traders out there that, that have a lot of success, but the point is like, give it enough time. People are ambitious and we're trying to improve our lives and our families' lives and all of that gets filtered through the economy, through the businesses, through the stock market. Um, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I thought this was a neat chart. Uh, maybe this is like a hard, hard left. Um, this is showing the peak to trough declines in historical bear markets. And what this is showing is all of the 20%, all of the bear markets that do, that do not have a 20% bounce. So apparently we have not yet had a 20% bounce in the S&P 500. We didn't? Didn't we have one in October? No, I think we had like 18. All right. So like, I feel like it's close enough, but I understand that you have to draw the line somewhere. Well, yeah, no, this is... Uh... So anyway, the point, I, I guess, I guess, so, uh, they all got, so they all got worse. I guess tying this back into the previous charts is that all of these horrendous periods to the market, horrendous. Never had that 20% bounce. No, no, no. They're all factored into the long-term return of stocks. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Like despite. These are in the, the number. These, these are, are in, in the, the number. numbers. Yep. These are in the numbers. I, so if you want to be there for the good times, you know, unfortunately for the most part, you got to be there for the bad times. I think intellectually, 90% of investors, 95% of investors understand that, but they don't care in some, some in the moment. It's like, yeah, but yeah, yeah, like this is fucked up. It's yes. like, no, it's always feels fucked up. Yeah. Uh, how many bear markets, like true bear markets, have you uh, been investing through at this point? I don't even know if I, I know. Well, I have my number. So I think 2011, that was like 19.9. So that's, yeah. for me, that's a bear market. Yeah. Um, 2015 was close. And then 2019, 2020, and then the most, I don't know, four. Yeah. So I think I'm at six. Now, I think the thing is the market recovered fairly quickly through most of them, with uh, this one being the exception. This one, this one, is, well, recover, recovered, like in terms of like got back to its made all time highs, made all time highs. Like I lived through a lot of V shaped bear markets. So that's right. That's right. Uh, all right. Well, listen, I, I think that's a, a point well made. And maybe what I would have done is shown this bear market chart first and then did the blue bars. <laughs> but I, I like it nonetheless. Uh, Salesforce reports earnings tomorrow night. This is a Dow stock and it's not like a high beta momentum stock and it was never really classified with the fang names but this is a gigantic global important technology platform it's i would say what's one market of the, cap Two i would say it's one of the most systemically important technology companies oh, in the world 163 yikes well i guess it got cut in did it get cut in half yeah it did it's i think it's down 40 percent from the tie or something um so the the rap on salesforce is that uh, he, there are five activists in this stock, which is almost unheard of. Like five, five activists and three of them are notable. And they're all saying the same version of the same thing, which, which is, is that what? the spending is out of control and Benioff should not be using the company as a platform to perform social engineering miracles. And there's obviously, you know, always some truth to, you know, if you have five activists saying some version of that, there's probably some truth to it. Well, and, they're also, uh, they got bloated like everybody else. So they had 25,000 employees in 2017. And the last I see is in 2020 was 50,000. Dude, Benioff left twice and came back. Do you know that? As the CEO. He left, came back, left, he tried to leave again, and, and he had to come back. Uh, he's, I, have he, a fr I, have a, I have a friend who, who works there, and it's just management, 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 yeah, yeah. management. All right, let me read this. Salesforce is facing a defining moment in its 24-year history. Uh, I think this is – who wrote this? Uh, what's his name? I like this guy from Long Island, so, uh, Sozi. Kaiser? Brian? Brian Sozi? Uh. Good guy. All right. Growth is slowing. Analysts are worried fundamentals will get worse before they get better. As companies curtail tech spending, a fresh round of layoffs at Salesforce have just been uncorked. Uh, at a company that's only known aggressive hiring. Co-CEO Brett Taylor is no longer co-CEO. Um, he's leaving to launch an AI thing. The guy from Slack who stayed, he now left. And Benioff is back. Well, and... who, who is more susceptible to the tech slowdown than Salesforce? They're at the center of it all. Yeah, enterprise tech. Like this I is mean, the, the, 
This is there. The, it's the main event for them. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, you have Elliott Management, who they do not screw around. These guys. Uh, Starboard Value, Inclusive Capital, Value Act, Third Point. These are gigantic activists, and I don't know if they all agree on what needs to happen here, but I feel like clearly something is going to happen uh, because institutions might be able to ignore one activist. It's hard to ignore five if there's a, a campaign like this. So let's put up Salesforce price chart. I mean, it could be an amazing buying opportunity for a company that it's very hard for its clients to fire them, and we know it that does, firsthand. I mean, the stock doesn't look terrible. Obviously, it's in a, you know, Got cut in half. It was three hundred five to three hundred five to look. It was one twenty five. Yeah, no, no, it went down sixty percent. Yeah, but, uh, so it I mean, stopped, it stopped going down. It's interesting also to have this many activists in a stock that's in the Dow thirty. That's that's like pretty. I think I feel like that's pretty rare. Here's Salesforce versus the iShares expanded tech software sector ETF, which is IGV, and the XLK, which is the whole tech sector, and Salesforce is in purple. So even in a tough environment for every company in the space, the, the drop in Salesforce is, is stands out. And this is total return price change on a percentage basis. Um, so some, something interesting is going to come of this. I don't, I don't know 100% what, uh, and it might be something in slow motion, like seats on the board turning over. Um, but I do think that there will be some sort of a, a change, and I'm definitely following the stock more closely than I have in a while. Any thoughts? I would much rather be a buyer than a seller. I think the stock is okay. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be interested in selling it. But like, uh, I don't know. I don't know. This is not like uh, an activist is like you have to spin off whatever or you have to sell the company. There's not going to be immediate gratification here. Well, they just they that, just they, they just did a huge round of layoffs. Yeah, they're probably going to do more. That's but what the they have to do. the company is at the epicenter of the storm, so it's you know it's tough. Yeah. I think people are going to I think I think if you buy it here, you might have to wait two or three years. But if they get religion on expenses and they can keep growing revenue, I think the stock's going to work. Yeah, I agree. So, um, all right, let's talk about this. Maybe is ridiculous. The Internet in its early days, but maybe it's not that ridiculous. So Mark Rubenstein has a great sub stack called net interest. He was writing about Stripe. They just they just uh, they're trying to raise money and whatever. We'll get into that in a second. But they 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 are expected to process a trillion dollars. Um, they have a 10% global share, but online spending, like e it's, tw it was 12% of global spend in 2021. When you put it that way, it sounds like there's a lot of, lot more room to run. Let's show this next chart from, from Galloway. So there was a massive acceleration, you know, uh, Shopify was, a big, yeah. Shopify was a big beneficiary of this. And then we've sort of coasted, we're digesting, but this line's only going one direction no? I don't, the question is, is there a natural ceiling for what percentage of total sales will go to the internet? And I think there is, but it's too early to say that we're anywhere near it. Yeah, I so totally I, agree. I, I don't totally think a 100% agree. of sales are going to the internet, but I don't think it stops at 12. I don't think we're anywhere <laughs> near the ceiling. Right. Um, but, but that's not the thing. The thing is the growth rate itself. So let's say we all agree at some point, we don't have to, but let's say at some point we all agree that a quarter of all spending is going to be e-commerce. Yeah. Whether it's on a mobile phone or a computer doesn't matter. Yeah, that's matter. reasonable. Yeah. Let's say we all agree one out of every four purchases will be done online. Okay. What is the rate of the what is the rate of growth to get there? Does it take 5 years to get there or 15 years? That makes a big difference when you're trying to value the stocks that are involved like Stripe. Well, so if you look back at the chart, it just seems the slope is pretty steady. Yeah. Well, no, you have to digest. We're di you could spend three years digesting the pull forward yeah, yeah. Uh, from 2020. I mean, um, it looks like that's what we're on pace for. So Silicon Valley Bank has, has a similar chart. U.S. VC investment company formation in the digital economy share of GDP. So digital economy share of GDP, I don't know exactly what's in here, but a similar number. It's not, it's not that big. Right. It just it went overboard. It could still be way higher five years from now. But it might need a couple of years of backing and filling just in terms of like lapping those ridiculous uh, few quarters in 2020 and 2021 when the only thing you could do was digital. Like people have other options now and they're, and they're shopping live and they're doing other things besides playing on their phones. And that's the period that we're in. 
And so I don't Stripe even think is it's that complicated. Stripe is doing a Series I. They're effectively a, a publicly traded company that happens to be private. Uh, at fifty five, down from ninety five. Good for them. It is what it is. Uh, look at their look at their revenue. This is pretty incredible. This is gross rev. Uh, yeah, it's it it is, and that's why it gets the valuation that it gets. Um, because even if it doesn't continue at that pace, it's pretty big. It's a pretty massive uh, growth rate. Um, the Series I is interesting. Goldman Sachs is setting up a special vehicle to sell this to wealth management clients, or they say a wide range of investors. This is from Bloomberg, uh, Jillian Tan, and a, a few other reporters. Uh, Goldman Sachs is offering its richest clients access to a fundraising round for Stripe. Um, the bank's setting up a special vehicle to its private wealth clients that will invest in just one asset. Stripe's roughly $4 billion fundraise. Um, separately, Goldman has a mandate, along with J.P. Morgan, to help raise funds for Stripe from a wide swath of investors. They need them. So, all right, this is what's interesting. Stripe needs the money like to a cash out to veteran employees who have restricted stock units in the coming year, and they have a big tax bill that's associated with that. So that's who that's who's the seller, right? Like, or that's where the the source of the that's where what the fundraising is needed for. I guess would be the right way to phrase it. And they had done this in 2015 for Uber, and I don't think it worked out great. If you bought Uber. As a private wealth client of uh, Goldman, they led that also in 2015. I don't think the stock is any higher its valuation than it was when it came public, which was three years later in 2018. This is a $33 stock. I mean, it's conceivable that this was a $33 stock in 2015 on the private market. I can't be 100% sure of that, but I don't really think like I don't it think was so. a home run. Looking, I don't I mean, think it was I'm a home just, run. Yeah. So anyway, I thought that was interesting. All okay, right, a, a, a few, a few, no, 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 hold on. We're sticking with this for a sec. A few more charts. This, so Michael Sembles did this kick-ass post. Look at this, interesting. Search and chat website traffic, the percent month over month change. Chat, GBT, and Bing. So there's no bullshit. I mean, it really did surge versus Google. How about that? Talk, talk to me in three months, though. I know, I know. But but the reason, like, look at look at Google's dominance. Did you hear Howard Stern talking about chat, GPT? No, <laughs> dude, I almost I had to pull over. He asked Chat GPT. His mother's ninety five years old, now oh, yeah. living alone, miserable. She, her apartment got flooded, so he like asked Chat GPT, "How do I make a ninety five year old woman happy?" And Ray Stern can he, never be happy, right? So that's the joke. So he's reading the suggestions that the AI uh, said, and he's like beside himself laughing. It's like buy flowers. He's like, the last time I bought her flowers, she said there were bugs in them. <laughs> uh, tell her a story, make her laugh, et cetera. I mean, it's good technology. It just may not be as practical or usable as we hope, at least uh, not yet in I, its I current just, incarnation. I, I think it is going to be uh, the real Going to be. Going to be. Agreed. So, so, so uh, this is a good chart. Share of total VC investment into AI. Look at this. Crazy. Yeah, no shit. You know, you know which direction this is going. Crazy. When, when and then you get the update of numbers for 2023, you know, uh, you know where this is headed. So they, they look at cumulative TikTok downloads. This is Bank of America. Cumulative TikTok downloads versus daily unique visits to ChatGPT. Is that apples to oranges? Uh, but no, yeah. I, I think it's just making the point that like that that's cumulative, and they're not the comparing dailies. the they're not comparing the two in real time. They're comparing how fast it took for them to take off. No, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're showing the cumulative TikTok downloads versus just the daily unique visits to chat. If they showed the cumulative for chat, it would be off the charts. You know what off I mean? The off the charts. Yeah. Uh, this two, is in, two, in two months, it had 100 million people use it. That's like, they, there's never been anything like that, I don't think, no, that's this taken is, so off this, that fast. So to the point about VC money coming in, this is great. So Roshan Patel tweeted, I created a fake LinkedIn profile of a founder. AI generated white male face, Stripe alum, Stanford dropout, going through YC, <laughs> polymath. Within 24 hours, I had a VC reach out to invest. So this email is so great. Hey, Chad, I'm an analyst for Blank Chad Ventures. Is, Chad is just so perfect. Well done. <laughs> and saw you were starting your founder journey. A few ex Stripe buddies of mine had great things to say about you. And I'd love to collect to learn more oh, about that you. Is it's so great. good. It's so so the, guy made up, the guy made up a backstory, too. That is <laughs> phenomenal. 
Wonderful. Uh, terrific. Yeah. Listen, I said the the I said the uh, the AI bubble of 2023, and I know these stocks have cooled off, but I'm sticking with my prediction. By the end of this year, we are going to see some wild shit. Unless there's like a massive recession, I I think that that bubble is just getting started. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stand on that. I bought um, I bought this. I bought my first meme. I don't know if it's a meme stock, but I did buy AI because I agree. I think it's gonna get stupid. But are you up or down? Uh, I'm I'm even. I'll probably sell it down fifty percent. I think the guy who started that is Tom Siebel, who had a publicly traded company in the '90s called Siebel Systems. I think this is him. He worked for Larry Ellison at Oracle, and he built like Salesforce before there was oh, Salesforce. Oh shit! I f- I've, I meant to make this my make the case. Remember, I, I this is to the earnings call. Yeah, actually. yeah. I think this is Tom Siebel's right. company. And it's, it didn't start like three months ago to capitalize on this. It's been around for 13 years or something. Um, all right. Uh, last thing we're going to do tonight, stock bond correlations. Uh, I just thought this was interesting. And we had somebody on the Compound and Friends talk about this. And I forgot who it was. So I wanted to ask you. Um, but this is Verdad, right? Yes? Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, Verdad is great. Uh, for the past 30 years, the correlation between stocks and bonds has been negative, which is good. That means stocks and bonds are moving in opposite directions. Therefore, that's helpful when you're building a portfolio and you don't want as much volatility as you would have if everything was going up or down at the same time. Um, But last year, the trailing three-year correlation turned positive for the first time since November 2000. This is something that many investors today have never experienced in their professional lives. Just like close your eyes, the year 2000, 23 years ago, if you're in your 50s, you really haven't lived through uh, a period of positively correlated stocks bonds. So Can, let's, you have the chart up. This is three-year trailing monthly stock bond correlations going back to 1929. And you could see that line going positive for the first time since 2000. What are your you, thoughts? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin this and say that this is actually a good thing. Yes, 60-40 investors – Many retirement accounts just lived through, uh, uh, hell is a strong word, but a really tough period for stocks and tough. bonds. Yeah, it's, I would say um, tough. Uh, but we're now on the other side of the mountain with respect to fixed income. I don't know what the stock market's going to do. I don't know what the bond market's going to do. But I do know that the, the six month can't go from zero to five again, right? So for the first time, the what last... would it have to do? What would it have to do from five to approximate zero to right. five? Yeah, eighteen. I don't know. Right. Um, I really don't know. Uh, but uh, but now, for the first time in over fifteen years, you no longer have to reach for yield. It's right in front of you. you... This isn't the question being asked, though. The question is: Does a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds get the job done? Going forward, yes. if this correlation remains in place, it's not going to remain a, in place. Regime. It's not going to remain. So I'm in so place. glad you said that, John. Put that chart back up. This period from 1965 through 1999, for most of that period of time, stocks and bonds were positively correlated. Well, Look. Th- it's a different story. That's because interest rates were falling and stocks were rising. Well, well that's, I have well, reasons for this too. Really rising, I have reasons for this too. We believe the proximate cause was the spike in inflation after COVID stimulus, which forced the Fed to raise rates, which in turn triggered the biggest bond market sell-off ever, and yes. repriced U.S. growth stocks, Correct. whose valuations depended on low discount rates. Yes. Um, but the specific details are part of a general pattern, and then they cite an AQR study. A key determinant, take this off, of the stock bond correlation is the relative dominance of growth uncertainty and inflation uncertainty. Stocks and bonds react to growth shocks in opposite ways. Stocks go up and bonds go down. But stocks and bonds react in the same direction to inflation shocks. Stocks go down and bonds usually go down more. Yeah. Well, the reason that's significant is if you think we're in for a period of higher than average inflation, uh, that correlation, we could be stuck with that for a little while. And yeah, I yeah. think- I'm not saying that it can't, it can't persist for a little bit. But, but put it this way. We're at least, if, if we're like uh, tracking the pain, we're at least like 80% through the Python. I don't know. I just showed you 1965 to the year 2000. That's a, that's a period of time with more inflation uncertainty 
than what we've had over the last 15 years, let's say. Like, we've had no inflation uncertainty until last year. So I'm just saying, like, it could be a new regime. And I think that's why you're seeing this explosion in interest in alts, because alts are supposed to be the part of your portfolio that neither acts specifically like stocks or bonds. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that's going to continue. Last chart on this. Inflation volatility, which is that's where you get the inflation uncertainty, right? Still, Still rising. And... You know, when you look at this over 23 years, it feels like it's just starting. So, like, it doesn't feel like it's a, it's it's over. It feels like it's, it's a just starting? Yeah. No, it doesn't. I'm not saying well, it's over, but it's not just starting. Uh, well, I'm saying it feels that way just on a time scale. It's We've had one year of inflation uncertainty. It's not like we've had 10 years of this already. Yeah, but I guess I would put it to you that how many – times in history were stocks and bonds down uh for Listen, do you want to buy together. gold or not that's all i want to know <laughs> say no more <laughs> say no more all right i'm gonna make the case i'm gonna make right, the case go for i got i got listen I'm, I'm backed up so i brought i bought a few charts john backed let's up. go through them this is the russell 1000 2000, 2000. my bad 2000 divided by the s&p 500 what do you think of this bullish. chart super bullish this is right? small caps starting to outperform large caps and i am here for it like bigly when is the last time? When is the last time that small caps have looked good relative to large caps? I can't even rem- remember. So it's got to be a very, very long time ago. I hope this continues. You know what this is great for? Capital formation. Like go on. like have a bunch of companies have a bunch of companies go public, build shareholder bases, and not have a stock market that's like everybody watching the same five names. I think it's good. I love it. Uh, next chart, please, John. What did I bring next? How about this, Josh? JP Morgan? I'm, 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 a share, I'm a shareholder forever and a day. Do you see what's going on here? Yeah, looks incredible. It Next should. chart, please. Look at where interest rates are. Yeah, but this is JP Morgan relative to the rest of the financial sector. Kicking um, ass. Massive breakout. Kick, kicking ass because if you're bullish on the sector, like Citigroup is not your first choice. You know what I mean? So, I, I listen, this stock came down. This a stock lot. came down last year, and it should have. A lot of their business in, in 2021 was IPO mania business. They made a ton of money, and then that business went away last year. But now there's interest rates, and now it's and now a lot of these fintechs that were supposed to supplant the banks, they're, like, not in great shape, and the big banks are still standing. So uh, I think this can continue. I've got one last chart for you. Did you know... That Hyatt Hotels is at an all-time high. Mm. How about when, that? When did this come public? I feel like it was private equity, and then they they did an IPO. Uh, I don't I don't feel like it's been public all this time. I could be well, wrong. How, but how about that? Uh, uh, Hyatt, yeah, you're right. Hyatt came public in 2009. I have to stay at the Grand Hyatt next year when we follow my daughter on spring break. So Where's apparently the Grand this Hyatt? is in. Uh, <laughs> wherever they go in Mexico or the Caribbean or something. So this is apparently a new thing now that did not exist when I was a senior in high school. But you know how all the seniors go on spring break I didn't uh, like in their senior break, year? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I did and, and uh, Sprinkles did. So apparently the new thing now is the kids still go, but the parents get a hotel room down the beach and are just like there on the island, I guess, just in case or – Maybe if the kid like wants to go out to a decent meal once or twice during the course of the week. So I have to go on high school spring break, and I'm staying at a grand high. Credit to, credit to my parents. They said, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm guessing they said, uh, yeah, if you have the money, you can pay for it. Oh, no. Uh, we're, we're, we're paying, and uh, I don't know. What are you going to do? Everyone's going, all our friends. All right. Mystery guess what? Chart. Guess what? I was the only one that didn't go. Yeah. What would you do that week? Don't, wait. Don't tell us. All right. <laughs> Myst- <laughs> Mystery chart. Uh, John, if you please, I'm going to give you two hints. These are both financial services stocks in the same sector. And they are in the new, one of them is in the news today. Okay. Oh, okay. So the purple line is Goldman Sachs Look and the, or- the orange line is Morgan Stanley. Look at you. Mazel. What did I win? <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. So yeah, Goldman had a rough day. Beat the shit out of the Dow. Goldman, so Goldman was sell. Uh, chart off, please, John. Goldman was. Is he going to sell- get, repl- get fired? Like, is the board going to throw him out? 
I don't think so. Goldman was a, uh, they had a, their second ever shareholder day. Like they don't do this. And it was a sell the news event. And most shareholder days are not sell the news events, right? They're rah rah. Mm. And usually the, sh the, the sell side is behind them. And, you know, you expect like they're going to have like really great stuff to say. This was more damage control. Um, I think they lost $3 billion in the consumer business and they're crying uncle. They're yeah, going to sell. Yeah. They, what they are they doing this, with all those accounts? I don't even know the, the status with Marcus. I think customer acquisition costs are terrible, which we all know. And I think but, they're, stop, they're stopping the checking services. Yeah, but the credit card business is worse. And they're locked into it. The one with they, Apple? Yeah, they're like contractually locked into providing this shit now. Wait, did that, did that ever get great. traction? No. Or it did, but the charge-offs are higher than people thought they would be. Yeah, stock doesn't surprise. look good. No, 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 no. It's bad. Um, I think so. Goldman, like every other big financial, is now screaming about how they're going to get bigger into wealth management. Obviously, uh, I don't know anyone that's not. Uh, actually, we're talking to Goldman's uh, head of uh, RIA custody tomorrow, so we'll see. We'll see what the kid has to say. Um, but that's like I spoke to. Them less, I spoke. To, I know what they have to say. Okay, uh, you spoke to somebody else. The the go. I only speak to the highest level people. You know this, Michael. <laughs> The, the, the go-to move, though, for these banks is like, oh, yeah, wealth management. It's a crown jewel for every one of them. So right. that's what Goldman wants. to. Do. Morgan Stanley, by the way, Morgan Stanley did played the last five years perfectly. Remember, when the, remember, when, remember when the dude from Morgan Stanley who runs our wealth management was on the cover of Barron's like f four years, five years ago? They, they no. crushed. Yeah, they crushed. Yeah. They, they bought E-Trade for $13 billion. That became a giant feeder Huge to win. their actual financial advisors on the wealth management side. They bought Eaton Vance. They have this huge business where they turn like oh, newly power, minted. Oh, Parametric. Parametric. Parametric's a great business. They turn like newly minted IPO millionaires into wealth management clients. They're yeah, very good it. at that. Yeah. And uh, I guess they're better at it than Goldman. All right, that's it for Mystery Chart. We want to say thank you to everyone who joined us live for the show. Sorry for our absence last week. We apologize. It was great coming back. Uh, I do have to announce that next week um, we are in Chicago. There will not be a live What Are Your Thoughts False. next Tuesday. Yes, there, there will is. be. Oh, we're we doing, doing it? it? We're doing it. All right, forget it. I, I'm not up to speed. We're we doing are it. doing it. I'm just we're kidding. <laughs> Come back next Tuesday. New, new Animal Spirits tomorrow morning with Michael and Ben on every podcast platform when you wake up. And at the end of the week, we're coming at you with an all-new The Compound and Friends podcast Pow -pow! Friday morning. We love you guys. Thanks for hanging with us. We will see you definitely next week.